glad you guys are here. Would you stand to your feet as we get to ready to worship a risen king who is not dead and buried in some tomb, but alive today and seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. So let's worship him in spirit and in truth this morning and lift our voices as we sing. See the tomb where he lay, see the stone. so thankful that we can sing a song declaring that you are alive. We don't make a pilgrimage to some grave or some tomb. You are seated right now inside God hearing the praises of your people. So today as we sing out, I pray that you would 
you would move in our hearts, God, that we wouldn't, um, that we wouldn't just come and, 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 and half-heartedly sing these praises and prayers to you, God, but that we'd sing them with all that we are. For you are worthy. Lord, we, we pray that not just in, in this building this morning, but in, in churches all around this area, as, as people sing praises to you, that your name would be lifted high, that men would be drawn to you. God, help us to catch a glimpse of who you are today. What a privilege and honor and joy it is that we can come into a place like this and sing and lift our voices without fear or trepidation, knowing that you hear us, knowing that we live in a country that allows this. Lord, we, may we not take that for granted. May we rejoice with all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat and watch this video. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Bedrock Roanoke. Uh, I'm Smooth Vi, uh, your missionary, all the way here in at our new home here in on the Nile River in Uganda. And yes, I do wear a vest and dress shoes down to the Nile River. That's just the kind of guy that I am. But hey, uh, first and foremost, we want to say welcome. Thank you for coming. If you're a first time guest, would you grab one of our welcome bags? We have like these gift bags for you. Uh, you can grab one of those on the tent, uh, at the tent, out, you know, outside, there's a tent. You can pick it up there and uh, fill out the card for us and you can drop that again. You can leave it at the tent on your way out or at one of the offering towers on your way out. And that'll just give us a chance to get to know you better because I mean, if this is your first time here, you have no idea who I am. I don't have any idea who you are and we'd like to get to know each other a little better. Uh, also, if you have any prayer requests, you can do the same thing, fill out the prayer request card, drop it in one of the offering towers. Uh, those get prayed over every single Monday, and so it's not something that we just kind of look at and throw away. There's actually real live people that would pray over your needs, so fill that out, drop it in an offering tower. A couple of announcements. Uh, we have a great opportunity for families coming up in July, and it's July 21st through the 24th, uh, with a family it's a family fusion mission trip so family goes together and you can have this kind of experience of being on mission together as a family speaking from experience is pretty awesome so you should sign up and go um, it is going to be led by Philip Biles one of the pastors from bedrock Roanoke and you're going to and I'm going to say this wrongly probably but I believe it's pronounced Chinkatig 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 I think is how I looked it up but the internet's not great here, so I did the best I could. I think it's Chincotig, uh, Virginia, and you're gonna be going there. And um, again, Philip Miles, uh, one of the pastors from Bedrock Rono, he's gonna be the camp speaker, uh, and it'll be a great opportunity for you and your family. I've probably taken up way more time than I was supposed to, so let me just stop there and say once again, thank you for coming. We hope you feel welcome. We hope you enjoy the service. And if it's your first time, I hope that you will actually take the time to connect with us because we would love to get to know you better. This is Smooth By signing out from the Nile River. It's always good to hear from Smooth. Uh, he, he did that video for us a couple weeks ago, and uh, you'll, you'll hear him from him uh, that way uh, as they move back to Uganda. And be in prayer for them. They're, they're building a house and finishing that up to uh, move back overseas for full time. And then uh, they've got a team coming in just a few weeks, so be in prayer for them as they lead that team and ministry over there. Hey, before we get started uh, with some more songs today, we want to just take a second and just give any cares, worries, fears, hurts, shame, joy, and we just want to take that and lay it at the foot of the cross this morning, lay it at the feet of Jesus, bring all of our cares to him because he cares for us and to rejoice in the Lord with gladness because he does live. And so as we get ready to sing a few more songs, we just want to ask right now that you would just take a second in your pew and, and just prepare your hearts to hear from the Lord, not just through the music that we're going to sing, but through the word that Joe's going to speak today, that he would be made big in your heart today.
world creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to live one cry then from to read a, a passage of scripture before we continue to sing and uh, this is from Philippians chapter 3 Paul is writing this 
actually from a prison, and it's called the Book of Joy. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. These are strong words uh, from a man who learned what it was to have plenty and learn what it was to be in want, but he knew Christ was sufficient. So as we sing this next song called Worth It All, we just, if, if you don't know if it's new to you, just let the words settle in your hearts, but if you do know it, please join us in song because he is worth it all.
us. Pray that that is not just a song with a, with a pretty melody, but it would be the cry and the desire of our hearts. That you would be the object of our affections and allegiance. Lord, that we'd see through the broken promises of this world to you, the only one who keeps his promises, the only one who can deliver on what he has promised. May we truly see that you are worth it all. Father, that we can let go of everything, that we can count the cost and say it doesn't matter, we'll follow you. Good morning, Bedrock. It's good to see everybody here today. We had a little bit of trouble in the first service with folks getting stuck at the Iron Man and couldn't get in. And so we had a little bit of a lower crowd. Some of them made it a little bit later. Did you any how many of you guys were aiming for the nine o'clock and you made it to the 1045 because of Iron Man? I think those folks probably either gave up and went back home or something, but I'm, I'm glad you guys made it and didn't get stuck in the traffic. Um, if you got any issues with that, Gary LaRue said he could fix it all with the Iron Man today. So apparently that's going on all over the place. But, um, you know, we need to keep those guys in, and gals in prayer too because that's grueling. I mean, they call it Iron Man for a reason. But there's a lot going on out there today in a lot of different places. But I am glad that we are here together to join in the studying God's Word this morning. Um, as you can tell, we're starting a new series, Wisdom and Folly. You see that. And so we are in the book of Proverbs. So uh, while we're beginning this, if you go ahead and open your Bibles, if you have those with you, to the book of Proverbs, we're going to be in chapter 8 today. We're going to jump around a little bit, but predominantly our main passage is in Proverbs chapter 8. So we're going to go there for a little bit. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we all understood Proverbs. You know, there's all kinds of Proverbs. There's the Proverbs that we have here in God's Word. There's Proverbs that are around across America and, and probably across the world that, that have different meanings in different cultures. So I, I put some of these together to make sure that we understood this. And before the first service, I sat down with one of our young ladies and I was like, let's, let's practice this. You get these, right? And she said, no. And I was like, uh-oh. Maybe this is not a good exercise. So let's see how y'all do with this. So the first one, this is an interactional, and you need to fill in the blank. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. drink. See, Maya, they do get it. <laughs> Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do. Today. Exactly. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mm-hmm. A leopard cannot change its 
The way to a man's heart is through his... Boy, listen to that one. James, you didn't have any trouble with that one, did you? <laughs> and then probably a lesser known, but maybe my favorite, and this isn't a fill in the blank because I wasn't sure if it was famous enough for you guys to catch it, but when you're in charge, ponder. When you're in trouble, delegate. When you're in doubt, you just got to mumble. <laughs> you ever use that one? No. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes works, especially on, on those of us who are older. I'm, I just think it's my hearing, and it's not really you mumbling. So sometimes we can get away with that. But these are Proverbs. These are Proverbs. These are the world's Proverbs. These are some of the things that, that have come through people's experience, sometimes good experiences, sometimes bad experiences, but Proverbs nonetheless. So now we have a feel for what Proverbs are. But how do we compare the wisdom of the worldly Proverbs to the wisdom of the Proverbs that God has given in His Word? Well, I want to set the stage for how the Proverbs that we study today, and hopefully more than just today, how, how do we come about these Proverbs? So in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon is the king. He is taken over for his son David, and he's having a dream, and in a dream... The Lord comes to him and he says, ask what I shall give you. Okay, now this is kind of a, a really cool dream. Some of you guys dream this when you're not asleep. Of, Lord, what are you going to give me? But He says, what, what shall I give you? Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, it seems as though the question were asked, if you won the lottery, what would you do with that money? Have you ever been asked that question? Had you come up with some really cool stuff? And you went, I'm going to, oh, wait a minute. I need to make sure that this is a good church answer, so I'm going to give it to missionaries, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, right? And then you go, well, really, it'd be a lake house, it would be a big boat, I'd pay up a student loan, you know, all those kind of things. So Solomon has this opportunity, but he hadn't even won the lottery. This is God, this is the creator of the universe coming to Solomon in this dream, and he goes, what is it you want? And Solomon says, Wisdom. I want wisdom. And God says in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 12, Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before, and none like you shall rise after you. That's pretty cool stuff. So what he's saying here, what God is saying to Solomon is, no one in the history of the earth has ever had more wisdom than you, and no one will ever have more wisdom than you. That's that's us. Less wisdom than Solomon. Now, we also know in James that he has said through James, if you lack wisdom, you just ask. So we have access to wisdom, but not necessarily the incredible depth of wisdom that Solomon had. And then he wrote this book of Proverbs to his son and to us. Now, the downside is his son didn't take his advice. If you ever go back and read 1 Kings, or 2 Kings for that matter, do you have any idea how many kings followed the way of the wise? Depends on the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You know the northern kingdom was Israel, the southern kingdom was Judah? <laughs> One of the two kingdoms, there were this many wise kings that followed the way of the Lord. So Solomon wrote it. They didn't listen. I hope we do a better job of that as we dig into this and begin to listen. So this is what Solomon has gotten. And just to put this in perspective with the depth of his knowledge and what Solomon's goal was for his son and what I believe God's goal is for us, I want to read for you the first five verses of the book of Proverbs back in chapter 1. So this is not, if you opened your Bible to 8, stay there. I didn't confuse you intentionally, but we are going to stay there. So let's go to Proverbs 1, the first five verses. I just want you to listen to this and pick out the words that you hear as we go through this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, Knowledge and discretion to the youth. 
Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. So you see, Solomon's goal here is that we would know wisdom and instruction, understand words of insight, receive instruction, give prudence to the simple, I claim that one, and give knowledge and direction to youth. All right there. And that's what he opens this entire Bible book that we call Proverbs with in his instruction to his son. And now the next few weeks, as we go through this series, this is exactly what we're going to endeavor to do through all of the topics that you saw in the little short video. You saw all those little bubbles popping up there, the thought bubbles or the text message bubbles or whatever. You saw those pop up there. We're going to address all of those issues, ideas, concepts over the next few weeks in the series. And in the course of that, we're going to try to look at wisdom and folly. Now, folly is not a word that we use a whole lot, I don't think. I mean, I, th I hope we know what it means, but basically in the bottom line is it means foolishness. We use foolish a lot. Are you a fool? Are you acting foolish? Knock off your foolishness. But the word folly comes from that. So when you say wisdom or folly, it's are you going to be wise or are you going to be foolish? Exactly. Some in different passages of the Bible would even take that foolish to the part of quit being an idiot, basically. So that's where it is because it's so cut and dried and yet none of Solomon's offspring bothered to heed his advice. And each week when we introduce these topics, we're going to try to look at three ideas in there. And the first one is, is that we're going to be seeking wisdom. Now, not the world's wisdom, but seeking the wisdom that can only come from God in here. This is where we're going to seek God's wisdom. We're going to find God's wisdom. So we're going to try to endeavor to find God's wisdom and contrast that with the world's wisdom. And hopefully, each week and throughout the series, we're going to choose wisdom. Do you remember in the video, and you see in the slides, there's two doors. The door of wisdom, the door of folly. And we each have a choice to make in all of our decisions. In all of our decisions, are we going to choose wisdom? Are we going to choose folly? Because when you open that door and you go down that path, they each have consequences. They each have consequences. And which door you choose has a lot to do with the consequences that you're going to experience as you go down that path. So today we're beginning all of this, and we're going to look at the presence of wisdom. Now, Solomon has done a pretty cool thing here, and that is that he personifies wisdom. What does that mean? That means that in the passage that we're getting ready to read, and if you go back to the beginning of chapter 8, we're going to jump in, 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 in about halfway through. But if you go back to the beginning of chapter 8, you'll see that in this passage we're going to read wisdom is actually speaking. And in other parts of the book of Proverbs, he gives wisdom uh, an identity, a personification, and it's a she. So he calls wisdom her. Now, I don't know why he chose her instead of him, but there's a lot of late. Look, I see that face. <laughs> wow. She knows why he chose her instead of him. That was quite a look. <laughs> the point is, guys, guys who are married, do you have any doubt as to why he said wisdom's a she? If you do, you should recognize every time your ribs hurt, when she's sitting next to you going, hey, because wisdom comes, to me anyway, it comes a little bit more naturally to our wives than it does to us. And sometimes we only gaze that wisdom through our wives. Ladies, y'all got a question about that? Any, any doubters? No, no doubters in here. We all agree. Guys, if you disagree, then you're not wise. <laughs> because she's going to tell you about it later. So even if you agree or disagree, don't, take, don't tell me. Don't shake your head because you're going to hear about it later. So anyway, for whatever reason, Solomon has decided that wisdom is a she. And he talks about that. And in this passage, he actually lets her do the speaking. So in the passage that we're about to read, wisdom is the one speaking. So let's jump in and begin in uh, Proverbs chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 22 to 31. 
Wisdom speaks and says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, and there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had even been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of men. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, as we consult your word, as we dig into your word, as we ask that you would speak your word to us this morning, uh, my prayer is that I would not be in your way. My prayer is that these words and the words that you would have us to share would leap off the page and into our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us in a manner that only you can determine. I pray, Lord, that we would walk out of here differently than we walked in this morning, that we would learn from this, that we would gain in wisdom. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we see in this passage is that wisdom existed even at the time of creation and before. So this whole passage is all about how intricate God's design for the universe and for our earth has been. And, and the fact that he exercised this incredible wisdom all the way through the journey. And, and the cool thing about this is because of this, and I keep using the word intricacies because, or intricate design, because it's phenomenal to me that if anything were the slightest bit out of whack in the operation of our solar system, you know, we wouldn't exist. You know, if, if, if the Earth's axis was tilted a little bit differently, it would change everything. If the Earth were any closer to the sun or farther away from the sun, we as humans couldn't exist because the temperature realm would not be that that we could withstand. The spinning of the earth and, and in relation to the sun and the fact that we have night and day and, have, and he's created for us a way, even with the, the orbit of the moon around the earth and the orbit of the, sun, the, the earth around the sun, creating our months, our days, our years. How phenomenal that is, knowing that we have time that we are to, to toil and time that we are to rest. And he set it up so there's daylight and darkness for all of that to happen. In all of this creation. And, and yet the wisdom of the world sometimes says, oh yeah, it just came into existence. It didn't, it was not created. It was just, it just happened. It just happened. That's folly. That's foolishness. And God has laid that on Solomon in the presence, or excuse me, in the personification of wisdom to help us understand that throughout all this creation, He's there and he's real. He being God, wisdom being that that he used in the effort of creation. And, and it's phenomenal. And Paul even speaks to this in Romans chapter 1. In verse 20 he writes, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, meaning those that are scoffers, are without excuse. You see, Paul is saying creation itself speaks to the existence of the Creator and the fantastic wisdom of the Creator. You know, when I was a, a, a kid in high school, I think it was, I, I heard a story about this, and I, I meant to look it up because I remember the story, but I don't remember who it was attributed to. It was St. Augustine, St. Anselm, one of, the, one of those kind of guys. Uh, the scholars of old in the early church. And he was describing this concept of creation. And remember that this is way back before any of the science figured out what really happened. This is 
Christopher Columbus, who thought the earth was round when folks, and some still believe today that it's flat. We're not going down that rabbit trail. But anyway, so St. I'm going to say Anselm because I think that's who it was. But he described the function of the earth and creation in general uh, with a metaphor of a man who's walking through a field. A man's walking through a wheat field. And he looks down and he sees a shiny object. And he bends over and picks it up and it's a pocket watch. And he's looking at this pocket watch and he's watching the, the second hand go around in the hands. And he watches for a while and it begins to move. Never seen a pocket watch in this story. But he takes it and, and he begins to, to open it and to take it apart. And he looks behind the face of this pocket watch. And he sees all those tiny little gears and springs and how they work together to keep this thing working. And he says, how in the world could you find a pocket watch like that, look at the intricate design and the operation of this and think that it just happened to be there? That it was not built by someone. That it was not created by someone. It just came off a stalk of wheat. And, and that's the same as is our creation. And, and you know, honestly, that's the same as the way we are. Look at the human body. Now, some of ours don't work the way they used to. But if you look at the human body and, and even the parts that we can't see, all that stuff that's inside and the way that it interacts and, and, and how many miles of whatever intestine and this, and it's all put together just right and everything flows through that or, or the miracle of a, of a normal human baby birth and how that takes place. And you doubt God that created man and woman? That's, that's absolute foolishness. How, how, can, how can you see all of this and go, yeah, we evolved from fish? It's not possible. It's not possible. It's foolishness. And this is what the stage that, that I believe that wisdom is setting for us in this or middle part of chapter 8 of going, hey, I've been around since creation. You need to listen. You need to listen. And Solomon is describing God's role in this. And why it's so important and why she emphasizes the importance of heeding her instruction. So as we jump back into this, in 30, verse 32 is where we're going to pick up. It's where we left off. And wisdom says, and now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. So you see, there's very clear instruction in, in just these three simple verses. The first one is, blessed are those who keep my ways. And you know, when I was reading this and, and studying for this, and I was like, blessed are those who keep my ways sounds remarkably familiar to me when we put this in another context. And, and if you remember Jesus' words in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. Interesting parallel that we have created here. As a matter of fact, there, there were some original um, theologians, commentators, whatever you want to call them, way back in the day that, that believed this passage in Proverbs was not really wisdom speaking, but was Jesus, or that Jesus was wisdom, or wisdom was Jesus. And, and that's, that's not to be the case. This is Solomon writing, and it is wisdom speaking. But listen to this incredible parallel that we can glean from this on, on the similarities. First of all, it, go back to creation for a minute. Who was there at the time of creation? God. Duh. But Jesus. This is a little out of order, but I want to share this with you because out of John chapter 1, the first three verses says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Listen to this. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. I know that as followers of Jesus that we know, understand, and believe that He's eternal. 
But sometimes it's easy to overlook the fact that he's eternal past and not just eternal forward. You know, we don't hear anything about Jesus, although it all points to Jesus. In the Old Testament, we don't hear anything about him by name. So sometimes it's easy to think, and some folks actually believe, that Jesus first existed when he was born in a manger. But that's not the case. All things were created through him. We, everything from Genesis on, was created through Jesus. That's why God said, let us create them in our own image. Because the entire triune Godhead was there at that time. But anyway, wisdom says, blessed are those who keep my ways. Jesus had said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In verse 32. Verse 33 Wisdom says, hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Again, a familiar passage came to my mind from Psalm 1. The verse, two verses of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Hear instruction and be wise, do not neglect it. Meditate on his law day and night incredible parallel another similarity if you will in the wisdom that solomon is giving and the instruction that god gives and then in verse 34 blessed is the one who listens to me watching daily at my gates and waiting beside my doors going back to john chapter 10 couple of verses jump out 7 and 14 we'll talk about what's in between in just a little bit John chapter 10 verse 7 and 14 so Jesus again said to them truly truly I say to you I am the door of the sheep I'm the good shepherd I know my own and my own know me some translations will say they recognize my voice blessed is the one who listens watching daily waiting beside my doors what Wisdom shares with us, and Jesus says, I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. What an incredible parallel, again, that we have here. Wisdom was present at creation. Jesus was present at creation. Wisdom is giving us instruction. Jesus has given us the same instruction. The door that leads to wisdom. Again, going back to John 10, we're not going to skip this time, 7 to 10. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, he reiterates. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. And have it abundantly. What's the tie-in in all this? It's the source of wisdom. Jesus is the door. If you come through the door, you will be saved, he says. And I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. See, this leads us directly to our memory verse for today's passage. Now, each one of these uh, messages throughout the series that we talked about on on the video is going to have a passage where we seek wisdom, find wisdom, and choose wisdom, but it's also going to have a memory verse. And at the end, we're going to put all this together with a handout you can put in your Bible or wherever you choose so that you see it on a routine basis. But in the meantime, we're just going to challenge you to make these memory verses. And I promise you, they're not, it's not like memorize Psalm 119. These are memory verses that should come naturally and easily, but it does take diligence, and meditation that we already talked about. And the memory verse for today comes from Proverbs 9, verse 10. And it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So we need to look at what is fear of the Lord The fear of the Lord in this concept, I believe, is not 
this shaking and shuddering in fear of the Lord and I'm afraid that the mighty hammer is going to come down and I'm going to be con condemned. And, and, and that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is that fear, that awe. Uh, in, in our context, it's the relationship with Jesus. The fear of the Lord is entering into a relationship with Jesus to understand that He did come and come to give us life abundantly. And if we go through His door, and we've talked about the two doors, the door of wisdom, the door of folly, you go through the door of wisdom, Jesus is the door, you enter into that relationship, that's the beginning of wisdom. Not the world's wisdom, but the wisdom of our Savior and our King. And then the rest of this verse, the second part of the verse, says that the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. You see, knowledge is necessary but it's not exclusive. If you haven't gone through the door first, then the knowledge is simply academic. But if you've gone through the door and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so we enter into that relationship with Jesus, then this knowledge that we continue to gain and to grow in is what we would call sanctification, becoming more holy, discipleship, any of those big churchy words. But basically what it means is continue to know and to grow. Gaining the insight to get more of knowledge of Jesus. So, but, but as I said, it, it, it can't just be the head knowledge. It's got to be in the heart. And that's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not academic. The fear of the Lord, the, the entering into a relationship, is a matter of the heart. Knowledge is a matter of the mind. It's the heart of the gospel. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he talks about the relationship of the wisdom and the foolishness relationship with Jesus to put this whole package together. And Paul wrote, he, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now Paul's not saying the gospel's folly. He's not saying the gospel's foolishness. He's saying the gospel is foolish to those who don't listen. To the world, it sounds foolish. But he says God's foolishness is greater than the world's wisdom. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You see, those of us, he's saying, who have entered into that relationship with Jesus, those who Jesus has pursued, he has entered into the relationship, called us to himself, preaching Christ crucified, that's all it needs. That's all there is. This bit of wanting signs and wonders, of seeking wisdom, there. Show me and I'll believe. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, even in the Titus series, or excuse me, in the uh, Empty series. But, but what's going on here is the distinction between head knowledge and heart conviction. The Greeks are seeking wisdom. They're seeking head knowledge. This is the heart of the gospel, the good news of salvation. Through faith in Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 puts it this way. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Okay. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. See Jesus already mentioned if you recall in the previous passage that we talked about in John. I'm the door. If you walk through the door you will be saved. Paul's talking about how this works. And in verse 10 he says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Do you see how it's both parts? 
There are so many folks that I have encountered. And, and I ask, tell me your story of Jesus. The churchy term would be, what's your testimony? I, I don't really like to use that because folks don't even know, like, if, if you're not in a relationship, you haven't grown up with church and all this kind of stuff, you don't even know what that means. Testimony is something you do in court. So I always ask, tell me about your story. How'd you meet Jesus? Tell me, your, what, tell me about your walk with Jesus. The sad part of that is the number of folks who say, well, I was raised in a Christian home. My parents took me to church every time the doors were open. And I'm like, okay, good. That's a great start. So tell me about your walk with Jesus. Well, I, I just did. Like, what? That, that... I, I'm not asking how your parents raised you. I'm asking you what's in your heart. I'm asking you about your relationship, not your knowledge. See, this is that distinction again. Is it the knowledge or is it the relationship with Jesus? If, if salvation cannot be inherited... Do we understand that, that salvation is not inherited because mom and dad raised me that way? It's got to become your own. See, Paul said, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that means giving him the ownership of my life. That means giving him the position on the throne that I've been sitting on my whole life. So a story about Jesus is different than your story with Jesus. And that's what all of this is pointing to. This is what all of this is about because it's about a choice, a choice that we have to make. And, and Solomon's going to put this in, in black and white for us through the voice of wisdom in the last two verses that we look at. Proverbs 8 again, the last two verses, 35, 36 says, For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. See, this is the choice that we have to make. It's a choice of life or death. It's a pretty clear choice. We say wisdom and folly, and that's all true. And in the things that we're going to look at in the future, it's going to be wisdom and folly. But today, it's life and death. Now, wisdom is speaking, if you find me, you have life. But the beauty of this, and this is where our parallel breaks down of wisdom in Jesus, because we don't have to find Jesus, he finds us. Jesus pursues us. There is no go finding him. And I've heard those stories too about so-and-so was in jail and they found Jesus. Jesus is in jail, but he's not in jail, so you can go find him. He's there because he's all with us in all places. He pursues us and he calls us to himself. And so that's the choice that I'm asking about today. If you've never made that choice or perhaps you have the inherited version of salvation, which means I was grown up, grew up, I was grown. I grew up in a church. My parents raised me to understand this head knowledge of who Jesus is. I've got this incredible knowledge. But the beginning of wisdom is the relationship or the fear of the Lord. And then we gain in the knowledge that is insight, as our memory verse tells us. How do we do that? We first acknowledge that we need a Savior, that we're not going to be able to get there on our own, that we cannot in any way, shape, or form earn our way into heaven. Paul says in Ephesians that salvation is by grace, which means you can't earn it and you don't deserve it through faith in our belief so that we may not boast it is God who does the work all we do is receive the gift so we turn away from that sin and when we turn away from the sin we're turning towards something except it's not a something it's someone it's Jesus and we turn toward Jesus and we run to Jesus and we enter through the door that is Jesus you see, today as we close this, we said we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at seeking wisdom, finding wisdom, and choosing wisdom. 
And today we're going to do that. We're going to seek wisdom, but it's not wisdom for the choice of whether we're going to go to lunch or go home. Today's wisdom is that we're seeking wisdom for eternity. And the good news is eternity begins the day you make the decision, not the day that we crumble these old fleshly bodies. Eternal life with Jesus begins the moment you enter into that relationship with him. We're seeking wisdom for eternity. We're finding wisdom in the gospel, in the gospel of Jesus who stretched out his arms and died in my place and in yours and yet conquered death as he rose. And we're choosing wisdom by surrendering our lives to him. By believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. My prayer today, if you've never entered into that relationship and never walking through, walked through the door of salvation with Jesus, that today would be the day. I'm going to be down front. That's embarrassing for you to come up front, wait till it's over, whatever. I'm going to be here. Find somebody that's with you that brought you here today. Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't walk out of here the same way that you walked in. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, for your message. I thank you, Lord, for your gospel. I thank you, Lord, for the salvation that can only come through Jesus. Lord, how great is your wisdom that you impart to us through the fear of the Lord. I pray that anyone here today who doesn't know you, that has the head knowledge and has never made the commitment, the confession to give you their life, that that would happen today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to worship a risen Savior. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested in my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remained
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with a freedom in hand. That's when. what it's all about right there the heart of the gospel when death was arrested and my life began what a great great wonderful kickoff to this series on wisdom and folly I challenge us all to remember this as we go through and remembering our memory verse at the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord and I just forgot the rest I would never do that. <laughs> hey, I want to take a quick second and just thank you guys for last week. You know, last week was Memorial Day weekend. We didn't expect a big turnout. And you guys absolutely knocked it so far out of the park that I was worried we were going to run out of work before we ran out of people. I mean, it was amazing. And um, through the week, as, as the bags got delivered to the Roanoke City, Roanoke County Police, the dispatchers, you could see the overwhelmed nature that they exhibited, that, that somebody cared. So you guys, we've asked many, many times, if Bedrock wasn't here, would the, would, would the community notice? And the answer is yes. Because of what you do, it continue to do. So today, you are sent to make a difference in your community. We love you guys. We'll see you back next week, and I'll have the verse memorized. There you go. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>